So in this video, we're going to talk about a bit more about stresses in soils. Um, and the question is, well, how do soils become stressed? Um, well, we can build something onto them. We can put a force into the soil. Um, but soils are also uh, stressed under their own weight. And that's what the focus of this uh, video is going to be on. Um, now, the self-weight of soils um, uh, creates stress. So how do, we, how do we determine that? How do we calculate that? Well, a good way to visualize it is if, um, let's say I had a, a soil and there was a ground level, um, and in, underneath the ground I managed to uh, transport out some sort of cube of material. So I was left with a, a cube of uh, a void, cube-shaped void within my soil. Um, and then quickly, to stop it from caving in on itself, um, I transported someone into it. And they, they were hold, now holding up the, um, the soil uh, to stop, uh, stop it caving in. Um, the question is, well, what uh, stress will they be uh, trying to keep, hold up at the top of this, uh, at the top of the, the roof, top of this void? Um, well, it would be equal to the weight of the column of soil above their heads. And I could calculate the weight of that column by, if I knew its density, its bulk density. And I multiplied that density by the acceleration due to gravity. So I knew, now knew its weight, or its unit weight. Um, so I'd get its unit weight. Um, and I knew how deep it was. I knew the dimensions of it. Now, if I was trying to work out the force, I would also need to know the, uh, the, the breadth and depth of my little um, chamber. Um, but if I'm just going for the stress, all I need to know is the, the unit weight and the, the depth of, uh, below the ground. So, um, and you can see it here. So if I have units in, of density, multiply that by um, acceleration due to gravity and get my unit weight. That has units of kilonewtons per meter cubed. And then if I have my unit weight and I multiply that by the height, or H, um, that would be kilonewtons per meter cubed multiplied by a meter, which would then cancel one of these meters out on the bottom. So I'd be left with kilonewtons per meter squared, which is the stress which is a stress uh, unit, and it's the stress um, at this point in the soil profile. So let's do a, a, a bit more of a realistic example. Um, if I have a um, soil profile, and I want to know the stress at point A and at point B, um, and I knew that point A was distance of one meter below the ground, and point B was three meters below the ground. I, if I knew the unit weight of the soil, I could work out what the stresses are at each of these points. So let's say I did some laboratory analysis. I took a sample back to the lab, and I found out what the unit weight was. And let's say that unit weight was 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed. The stress at point A would be equal to the unit weight multiplied by its depth. So 20 multiplied by 1, which would be 20 kilonewtons per meter squared. Similarly, point B, it would be 3 times that. So it would be 20 times by 3, which would be 60 kilonewtons per meter squared. So this is quite a simplified example. Um, could you imagine any problems if we were starting to look at more realistic soils? Do you think um, that unit weights will stay the same 
So this assumes that you've got constant unit weight throughout your soil. But would you expect unit weight to change? We know that bulk density increases with depth. So you would also expect the unit weight to increase with depth. So this is a simplification. And in some cases, uh, it's uh, using the, the average uh, unit weight. What about water content? What effect do you think water content will have on the stress calculation? OK, so going back to my original uh, cartoon here, if I, um, I say it rained on this soil, um, so um, I started filling up this material with water to the point where I had a, a water table that was, you know, somewhere up here. So now the, the chamber is underwater. Um, maybe we give our person an air tank so they can still breathe. Um, <laughs> So we have a, a, a water table in our, in our profile. What does that do for the, ter for the stress within uh, this, this space? Well, you can see that the, this, um, this chamber will be filled up with water. And that water pressure will then help um, push up the, the roof of this, 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 this chamber. Um, so you can see that the stress that the uh, person will be experiencing would be less because of the water pressure helping to, to support the, the, the roof of the chamber. Um, assuming that there's no changes in bulk density because of the water up here, but I mean, this is a cartoon, so it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be real. Um, what is the water pressure at this point? Um, well, the water pressure is calculated in the same way as the um, the uh, the weight of the soil. So we take the density of water now and we multiply that by the acceleration due to gravity um, and we get the unit weight of water um, and then if we knew the depth below the water table so when we're calculating water pressures we always take the depth below the water table and let's call that uh, D the depth below the water table. If we take the unit weight of water and we multiply that by D, we're left with the water, stress of the water. And we give that the symbol U. So that's um, water pressure. So Go back to the original example. Let's say we have a unit weight of, um, of 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed of uh, soil. And let's say the depth below the water, uh, depth below the, the top of the soil profile, H, is equal to 3 meters. Now let's say the depth below the, the water table. Uh, D is equal to 2 meters. What would be the stress um, experienced by the person uh, within this, this little chamber? Um, well, the uh, original stress we would just calculate by taking the unit weight and multiplying it by the depth which would be equal to 20 multiplied by 3, which would be 60 kilonewtons per meter squared. But now we've got the water uh, helping push up the, the top of this little chamber. So what would be our water pressure? What well, would be U would be the unit weight of water multiplied by D, the depth below the water table. Um, now the unit weight of water is... Um, the density of water, which is one megagram per meter cubed, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which was 9.8. Um, some people can uh, like to round this up to 10. Um, so if we're using rounded up numbers, it would be 10 multiplied by 2, which would be 20 kilonewtons per meter cubed, uh, meter squared.
So the stress that this person would be experiencing within the soil would be equal to the stress um, that the soil is exerting minus the, the, stress, the pressure that the waters are providing. So that would be That would be equal to 60 minus 20, which would be 40 kilonewtons per meter squared. So this helps to uh, explain or introduce uh, one of the most important concepts within soil mechanics, and that's the concept of effective stress. Um, so this is effective stress, this uh, sigma prime. This is what we use to uh, donate effective stress. And that's incredibly important uh, when we're thinking about uh, um, stresses within soils. And I've probably left you with the, um, uh, the, the, the feeling that somehow water pressure is beneficial. And I suppose in this case it would be for the, the person um, within this chamber. But actually, when we're thinking about stresses within soils, water pressure can be, um, uh, can be really um, quite, quite detrimental. Um, because the, the strength of a soil um, is really a function of the effective stress. Um, and if you increase the, the water pressure, you reduce the effective stress. So um, have you tried to use this as a, as a this cartoon as a, as a sort of an, an explanation or an introduction to effective stress? Don't think that water is somehow beneficial to, uh, to stress conditions within a soil because it absolutely isn't. So an important thing to consider is how effective stress changes within soils. So if I have a, a soil, um, and let's say it's got, uh, it's got some sort of, uh, it's saturated, it's got some sort of water table right at the surface. Okay. And let's say I subjected that soil to a loading, so I, I stuck a footing onto it. From, so from a building and it's some sort of force coming through the, uh, the footing. Okay, so how do you think um, the effect of stress or the stress conditions, so the total stress, the water pressure and the effect of stress will change at a point below the, the footing? So the total stress, the pore water pressure and the effect of stress, how will they change um, over time? Well, the total stress, um, if we draw it on a, on a graph, the total stress might look something like this. So we have total stress in time. Uh, total stress would be starting off uh, somewhere around there, and then we stick the footing on and it jumps up to an, a new point. So what will happen to the pore water pressure? Well, the pore water pressure will do something similar um, with time, and that um, it will have an initial value. So we will have an initial value, um, and then when we put the footing on, that initial value will jump up. But you can see that if we move uh, far enough away from the footing, the pore water pressure won't have changed that much. So it's only, only underneath the footing where the pore water pressure will change. So that leaves us with a, a region of high water pressure um, around the footing and low water pressure as we move away from it. Um, so you can see that the, the, the pressure in the, in the water will, will try to dissipate and water will move um, away from the footing. And the pore water pressure will, will decrease. Um, so you have an initial increase in pore water pressure, but as the water flows out of the soil, the pore water pressure will decrease until it reaches somewhere around what it used to be in the ambient conditions. So what does that mean in terms of effective stress? Well, effective stress is equal to total stress minus pore water pressure. So 
if you take if you have this graph and you take away this graph, what you're left with is effective stress. Um, yeah, it'll have an initial value. Um, but you can see that the total stress will be almost um, taken up by the, the change in pore water pressure. So um, you won't have any initial change in effective stress. And it's only after time that this pore water dissipates will that total stress uh, be transferred into effective stress. So your graph will look something like this. So if effective stress is important um, for the strength of soils, um, we need to know how it evolves over time. Um, and you can see that the, the rate of evolution, so how quickly the, um, the pore water pressure dissipates, is a function of the permeability of soils. So for things like sands and gravels, we would expect the effective stress to, um, to change almost instantaneous, so the pore water pressure to dissipate almost in instantaneously. For things like clays, this is a lot more problematic because it can take years or even decades for the effective stress to, to change. So it's important to understand how these effective stress conditions change with different types of materials.